right, Ken, thanks for uh, thanks for joining us for this episode of Espresso 4.0. Super Happy glad to, be to have here. you. Mm -hmm. I we spoke a little bit offline, or rather online, but off off camera, and I'm super excited for some of the questions that that I was thinking of having uh, to ask you. But before I do, why don't you give a little about a little intro about yourself? Sure. So I I have about 25 years of experience dating myself way back to about 96, where I've been in the in the enterprise resource planning or ERP software and enterprise software business. And uh, I have worked for three software companies, three ERP software companies, one called Bond back in the, in the 90s, uh, one called Infor Global Solutions in the early 2000s to 2016, 2016, when I sold my consulting business to a company called Priority, which is Israeli-based, and I built their North American presence. Mm -hmm. Well, as someone that's worked in with ERP and digital solutions in the manufacturing industry for over two decades, actually you're in your third decade, wanted to ask you, in your experience, what is the importance of digital solutions, ERPs and generally digital solutions within the manufacturing industry? Let's start with a very broad question. Right. So it's basically ERP. You can think of ERP as sort of a backbone or a, or a back office type um, product that handles everything from sales or entering leads, opportunities, sales orders, purchase orders, production planning, all kinds of things like that, all in one sort of hub, if you will. And then um, I'm going to use the analogy of, of an airline here and the airline system. The ERP is the hub in the hub and spoke system. With an, with an airline, with a, you know, going through, let's take uh, United here in, in the States, uh, going through yeah. O'Hare Airport and everything, and all the airports are sort of spokes off of that. Sure. So the ERP is the backbone, and then all the other add-on solutions such as e-commerce. So you have like a WooCommerce or a Shopify or something like that would, would sit as a spoke and feed in orders. Mm -hmm. from the from the web uh another example is mes systems i think you're familiar very familiar with mes systems manufacturing execution systems it stands mm -hmm. for, that would talk to machines uh gather machine data actual usage downtime the efficiency of the machines and everything and and pass it back into the erp system and the erp system in turn would pass through uh, jobs or production orders and gather data because it has data about the routings and the operations. And so those two marry up. So you got a spoke feeding the, the hub and vice versa. In and in terms of value, both in what ERP can provide and other uh, systems and solutions that you mentioned, MES, uh, e-commerce, whether it's uh, Shopify, whatever it is, it's what are the values? Well, obviously, the first one is the speed of communication, yeah. uh, gathering data, removing, going paperless as much as possible. Yeah. Um, anything else you can think of? Yeah, sure. I mean, it becomes a huge storehouse of data, right? So actually, the, the hub and the spokes gathering tons of data and enabling you to do analysis across all of those uh, parts of the of the entire system. So yes, it is becoming uh, one source of the truth. We call it right. Mm -hmm. So all the data is um, is contained in in the hub, mostly in the hub, and you're able to do uh, predictive analysis. That's that's kind of the holy grail of all this, the entire footprint of these ecosystems. That's right? where it's I was the, going at. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. the, don't mean to steal your thunder or anything. No, uh, not at all, not at all. Uh, but, um, you know, it, it, traditionally ERP systems, like you started with in, in the 90s with uh, actually maybe even the 80s, you could say, with the systems that were used for planning, and then they got more into uh, all the other functions within the organization. And then they grew each time with, with uh, add-on solutions up there. So you have a lot of on-premise. So out there, uh, and we'll we'll talk about cloud in a second, but 
there's a lot of on-premise systems that even though they are big storehouses of data and big hubs, there there are multiple, what's happened with, particularly with big companies, right? You get a bunch of these le legacy applications, multiple servers, because it's client server before it was cloud, right? So you get all these ones that don't talk to each other and they become very siloed. And so that uh, that vision or that holy grail of being able to do predictive analytics all across the system is is chopped off in that nice. because nice. you have these silos and that's not just silos of data or uh transactional and historical information it's also a, a silo of your people right mm -hmm. you got different parts of your it devoted to different systems and and all of that so it creates a, sort of a uh, an hr issue or a change management issue within your people so that's that's a really important part. Got it, got it. So apart from, we're gathering all this data in fact, whether it's uh, regarding your resources or whether it's your process data or quality data, or what might have you, so that you can predict outcomes yeah. in the near future and make better decisions, right? Discover some insights that you would otherwise be unaware because there's just like too many different variables that we can now process in a much better or organized and aggregated way, curated way, right. if you will, and make better decisions, move to a data-driven uh, organizations as opposed to intuition-based or experience-based or what have you. Yeah, You've exactly. actually foreshadowed a little bit of uh, what my next question would be. So right. you mentioned, mentioned the, the companies that are they were a little bit ahead of the curve and adopted such solutions in 80s and 90s right? Which were, they, they would have been early adopters in a sense, in a lot of ways. Yes. But some of them are now stuck in legacy solutions, right? Right. You've mentioned the problems of legacy solutions, some of them at least siloing of the uh, of the data and, and also people in HR. Uh, can you expand a little bit on what are the trappings and how do they get out of these situations? Sure, sure. So the trappings is obvious. Uh, you've got all these different on on premise hubs. It's it's almost like having a, a you know a Chicago O'Hare for United Hub, and then you've got uh, Atlanta Hartsfield down here, or or maybe a Heathrow to give a more European example. Thank you, you for multiple. For, yeah, there you go. <laughs> for the Euro shout out. <laughs> or skip all in in uh, the Netherlands or whatever. Yeah. But uh, these become you you've got this. You've got splintered hubs, even. So you got all these multiple hubs, and they have their own spokes. So it's essentially impossible to to in integrate unless you come up to a, a single or you know multiple uh, situation on the cloud where you where you tie all these things together. But they're stuck on different versions, right? Because what happens over time is these systems, an SAP R3, uh, an Oracle EBS, they become very heavily customized for that particular division or that operation that's on it. And what's happening is SI, for example, systems integrators, for example, like an Accenture, I'm not gonna call out names or anything, but uh, they, their incentive is to get the, the, just get the systems up and run, right? Without any kind of digital transformation plan that draws the whole, that paints the whole big picture and allows them to work towards that big picture. Instead, their incentive is to, we have an Oracle practice. Boom, you're doing Oracle. Okay, yeah. so yeah. let's get started and, and, and let's build that and let's try to roll out as many modules as we can. But it still sits in its own silo. And it, uh, a company that uh, did that early on was an early adopter. What they tend to do is they get all of these sort of splintered siloed uh, situations where they have to take a step back. Mm -hmm. That's what you have to do. You have to take a step back and say, given this is our situation, and you have kind of an inventory of all the hubs and all the spokes, and you say, all right, this is the current situation. This, these are the current business metrics, KPIs, and everything that we want to achieve with the whole ecosystem. And then start planning with, with a change management plan. Frequently, the, you know, if you just went ahead with a legacy system, you didn't have a change management plan, for instance, to deal with the people and the training and the documentation and the testing and all of those things didn't exist. Or maybe they existed for the Oracle EBS system, but not the SAP R3 
system. For example, just to call out a couple of old legacy type applications. So that's what you need to do. You need to step back. And um, it, you know, probably what I should do is give you a kind of, uh, I'm, not, I'm not getting paid to say this, but there's two organizations that I really, really like for doing this kind of pre-assessment or doing a new as is, call it a new as is, and a new future state, okay? Mm -hmm. Including change management, including all those uh, sort of preparation steps that you have to make for a, an entire digital transformation. So the one is called Third Stage Consulting Group. They're in the U.S. based in um, in Colorado. They also have uh, European, they have a, a U.K. subsidiary, um, South Africa and Asia as well. Uh, and they're, you know, if you go out and you'll see, you'll see Eric Kimberling's name, he's the CEO of that. Um, and they're, they're taking a more tech agnostic <laughs> viewpoint, right? To say, okay, this is the system or system that you should be on, mm -hmm. right? And you should be on the cloud. Okay. And that, that's one thing I was, the last thing I was going to talk about. But, um, uh, I like those guys a lot. I've done work with them. So I know that I know that they're good and they're they're a bit smaller, right? They're not a they're not an Accenture, but what they are is is um, really talented. And you'll see a lot of the videos out there of, of all the things. And they have digital stratosphere conferences and all kinds of things like that. And I just think they're a really good organization. Probably a bit cheaper, probably uh, you know less incentive to drive up the consulting costs or or whatever. You know, have huge teams. The other one is called Pemico, P-E-M-E-C-O. They're in Toronto, Canada, um, and uh, their uh, CEO is Jonathan Gross. So you, uh, if you if you guys choose either one of those, say Dan sent you. Ah, uh, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> okay, deal. We'll get treated well. There um, we go. <laughs> uh, got it. Did I? Did I? Uh, one of the things that you've mentioned, I think, if I can, if I can boil it down, is. Um, Avoiding vendor locking when choosing a solution, yeah. correct? Because yeah, that absolutely. takes away a lot of your agency and in, in, in getting new add-ons and modules and maybe one different provider or maybe once you choose to cut ties with this one, you want to keep your data and integrate mm -hmm. it easier into other solutions. Got it. And, and Throughout the conversation, as well as in, in your in your content, you seem to be a huge cloud component. Yeah, could you tell us why? So I I, I think that on prem systems is uh, is an unsustainable model. At, in the end, right? Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of reasons for that. One is simply that you know the human the human resources or whatever professional services. It's just not going to be, I, I feel like it's dying in the sense that, you know, you've got younger generations coming in. They're not going to want to enter, you know, enter an uh, order into a sales order directly into an ERP system, for instance, on a laptop. They want to do something that's totally in the cloud. All the data is in the cloud. All the applications are in the cloud. And then they're going to consume it with mobile devices and things like that. But the only, the only way you're going to do that is to get away from the on-premise model. Uh, second thing is, I, I think that, uh, you know, you got dinosaurs like me. Who understands and who wants to learn? Who understands and who wants to learn an older version of a, an SAP or an Oracle or whatever? Call out the name, it's, it's, it's fine, right? Who's gonna learn that? Um, and uh, so I, I just think it's unsustainable model, but, uh, the biggest thing, I guess, with the cloud is that all of those pieces that I talked about can all be on and and all frequently are already on the cloud, right? So you don't get an e-commerce that's on the cloud or you don't get a, a BI solution, a business intelligence solution that's able to pull from the cloud and also pull from on-premise systems, right? So it, that's why I'm such a huge proponent um, of the cloud and so performing let's say a, a lift and shift type process right to get up to to take an on-premise older version of, of an ERP package or whatever the system is and bring it up to the cloud and when you do that you you have an opportunity to rationalize things right so you can rationalize customization for instance these stovepipes your legacy applications they tend to 
you know, take on a life of their own, right? And there's the customization. Oh, you know, you need a report to do this. You need a customization to do this in addition to the software. So it makes it difficult to get it up to the cloud. So you have to kind of rationalize those customizations and look at new functionality and say, hey, but the new, new functionality does it, or there's a report that does it, or there's a report writer that goes with the, you know, ERP system that does it. So, so why redo that customization when I bring it up to the cloud? So that, those are kind of some of the things. Uh, another thing that I've been, you know, kind of just formulating lately, um, mm -hmm. and I, you know, in some of my interactions with third stage consulting group, they, they, uh, came up with a company that I'm just getting, um, anointed with is, it's called Palantir. Um, and what they do is they kind of take the data in from all these different sources and kind of leave the legacy application structure in place, but pull all the data up into one repository and allow data analysis on it. So it, in a way, it can be a kind of a Band-Aid while you've got all these legacy applications and you're working towards getting everything onto the cloud, mm -hmm. then it can be a Band-Aid or it even has some things that could stay permanently. Um, and there's, you know, there's another system called Anvisant that I've been using, which is, is, is sort of a day, data warehouse solution that can pull data from legacy applications. So it brings it all up into one data warehouse, and then it has all kinds of KPIs and uh, dashboards and things like that. And, and most importantly, uh, AI built into it and predictive data analytics is, is all built in, right? So... That's a process of, and that could be an, also an interim process and one that's already in place while you're working on a cloud project to take all your ERP systems and standardize on one, that you're still getting all the data, historical data, you know, so you don't have to do a data migration, for instance. That's the cool thing about it. Either a Palantir or an Anvisant says, you know, I can have seven years of general ledger history, right? Mm -hmm. And and that's all sitting where it sits. So if that's on SAP, it sits there, no problem. You run a, a you know a routine at night that loads all that data into the data warehouse, and it crosses crosses systems and allows you to do the KPIs and the analytics and predictive modeling, which is again the holy grail. Understood. Well, thanks. Call me convinced. Oh, good. <laughs> I'm glad. <laughs> Checks and in the, the mail, right? Checks in the mail. Checks in the mail. It's uh, it's coming. It's <laughs> on its way. Uh, before before I do before you do receive a check on the related subject, how do you address the concerns that sometimes uh, proponents of cloud have, particularly in terms of cybersecurity? Ah, uh, right. So um, the way I would say that is is when you're on the cloud and you're the Frequently, uh, cloud systems, any systems, ERPs or whatever, are on Amazon Web Services, mm -hmm. for instance, right? It has its own uh, Microsoft Azure, Azure, same sort of thing, right? You have single sign-on. You got multi-factor authentication. You got databases, applications, everything being backed up constantly. Hot backups going on, cold backups, redundancies, and all of this stuff. But the, the way in with single sign-on and multi-factor authentication is highly secure. So that's, that's what I would say to somebody who says, oh, you know, you want to put it on premise. Well, that's even more dangerous, right? Because then you have multiple potential failure points, right? Or ways in for hackers, for instance. They hack into a server. There you go. You know, which, which could be easier than then because there's only one way in or one uh, procedure with the single sign on or whatever that that is the, the key to having everything on the cloud and providing the cybersecurity. so you basically take advantage of the platform the aws the azure or whatever it is and you don't have to worry about a proprietary database or something like that right so it can be hacked that can be hacked and different nodes that can be hacked <laughs> independently basically it's it's uh so not only is it harder to maintain in general, you know, in terms of database and operating system and all that, you, you've got this multiple failure point uh, that, that is, uh, you know, places where cyber security is, is at risk or hackers can come in. So that's what I, 
That's what I would say to that argument. Gotcha. Well, there you go, non-believers. Um, all right. Thanks, Dan. Uh, that kind of answers all my kind of serious questions. Oh, okay. <laughs> wanted to wanted to ask you a little, want to introduce a little bit of levity, ask you a little bit of more relaxed questions to get to know you better for our viewers to get to know you. Mm -hmm. um, so if, uh, let's say I, I called you at uh, 2 p.m. on a Sunday, what would I be interrupting you? Okay. This is a trick question, right? I'm supposed to be saying I'm in church. Uh, you're supposed what to be I'm saying you're be saying? in church, correct? <laughs> okay. Well, I, I failed that test. Um, so I, I would say there's a number of things, and it depends on the season. Uh, right now, fall and winter, I'm really into American football. I should say American football, right? Not soccer, which is yeah, real please football. make the distinction. Yes, we're not <laughs> going to get into all the, this whole the whole thing. Exactly. So I'm into the NFL National Football League, and I have a. I'm working on this uh, what I call my bucket list tour of all the NFL stadiums. So there's 32. Actually, I guess there's 30 stadiums because a couple teams are double playing the same. Uh, auditorium or whatever, uh, the same stadium. And I'm busily working through that. So what I do is I take trips usually with my sons and I meet up with friends in the cities. And usually the games are on Sunday. So 2 p.m. on a Sunday is probably where I'm watching the game or I'm getting, you know, doing happy hour or whatever before the game tailgating. So that's, that's where you could catch me in the winter wintertime. Uh, so uh, a lot of times. And then, you know, shooting basketball with my kids. I created a court out here in the driveway. Um, I also have a couple of uh, muscle cars, American muscle cars. So I have a 2010 Dodge Challenger with a Hemi SRT8 engine in it. It really goes zoom. And then my latest one is uh, a 57 Chevy. So I have a 57 Chevy 150, it's called. It has a Corvette engine in it. So it also goes zoom. And, uh, and it's really fun to drive because I, I put a, well, it had when I bought it, a six-speed manual transmission. So I'm unlike a lot of other Americans, and I, I actually can drive a stick, you know. Oh, sure. Wow. <laughs> very well, European, I, did, I, I, yeah, indeed. I think you will get along very well with our CEO. He is also a huge uh, car fan and collector. So, yeah, um, yeah we'll, we'll, we'll put you in contact one day. But Great. um and yeah, you're not a leisurely fan of NFL like you are going to each stadium. This is not a joke. Oh yeah, no, it's not a joke. And <laughs> and what I do is I I wear um I'm a Pittsburgh Steelers fan mostly, but they're doing oh, bad. my they're doing roommate, this my, year. my my roommate was a huge fan of Steelers. He's going to be happy. My college roommate. <laughs> yeah, so they they travel well. I mean, you know, sometimes I'll wear my jersey. I try not to offend the. The people that are in the stadium that, you know, like if I'm going to see the Cleveland Browns, for instance, I'm going to be wearing like a, a Jim Brown jersey or something like that. You know, <laughs> Jim Brown, you know, I, I love the classics and I love I bought a lot of, you know, kind of football jerseys of, of stars. You know, I pick a star like Joe Montana from the San Francisco 49ers and say, I'm going to wear that jersey yeah. to that stadium. So when I go yeah. to Levi Stadium, I can either wear that or sometimes I'll wear a Steelers. Or whatever, but not in a place like Cleveland. I mean, because not only am I probably going to get beaten up, I, I I'm sort of disrespectful to the Cleveland fans in a way, right? So, yeah, yeah. Uh, so I do it. I I kind of try to do it that way. Have a respect for the uh, the old stars and everything like that. I think it's kind of fun. And, and to respect the local culture, yeah, um, so to speak. Um, okay, fair enough. And uh, last but not least. Anything cool you've recently witnessed in terms of new tech, uh, software, whether it be an industry or otherwise? Yeah, so so the EV charging industry, mm -hmm. I find very interesting. Um, my former colleague that was with me at Priority uh, for the four-ish years, uh, he left to join this company. It's called Drives, D-R-I-I-V-Z, drives.com. Mm -hmm. And what it, what it is, is, and he explained it to me because, you know, he knows how to pique my interest. He said, this is essentially the ERP software of the, the EV industry, right? <laughs> so it's actually, it's actually a very cool it's, it's software and tools to manage uh, EV fleets, the rental cars, uh, buses, personal 
uh, personal EV charging stations in people's homes. And it monitors, in a way, it monitor, monitors the grid. So you, uh -huh. you can say uh, this car uh, would be low on charge or not getting charge or whatever. It can kind of say this is a this is a node that you know needs to be replenished from a bus fleet or something like that. So it's really cool. It kind of balances and makes it more efficient. And I think it's probably also making transactions. Yeah. Maybe I I don't understand the whole thing, but you know he's the sales guy, right? So he can tell you everything. This guy's <laughs> name is. Ron Rosenfeld, he's a good buddy of mine. Um, and uh, but but drives is very cool. Well, we'll check it out. We'll definitely check it out. Uh, that sounds cool. We we're actually talking about how cool the EV cars are because they're a huge thing in Europe. There's also in Luxembourg specifically. There's some kind of the government is uh, is kind of encouraging the switch to either hybrids or even more so EVs. Mm -hmm. And um, but then there's the charging part and the logistics revolving on like planning ahead. If you, especially if you're making long, long journeys, how do you do that? So this kind of thing, there's quite a bit of a market for that. So your, your friend, I think, uh, he's on summer. Yep. Yep. Okay. And I think, I think they're going to make, uh, the, uh, I think they're going to make a Dodge Challenger actually as an EV. But, you know, I have having that big engine that goes, you know, it, it makes this. Isn't that the most of the appeal? I know, right? So um, I have a low carbon footprint. I'll have to say that uh, okay. because I don't drive very much. You know, I don't have to travel or anything like that, like the way I used to. So uh, it has a very low carbon footprint, even though it's not an EV. And I, I kind of need that sound. But, you know, it's easy to duplicate the sound, right? You can make it sound like it's shifting gears when in fact it's not so uh i'm not too worried about that for now i'll keep my low low carbon footprint dot challenger in my in my 57 and then uh just not drive it too much yeah got it well yeah i don't think that's a problem if you're driving it just for for pleasure every once in a while mm -hmm. thank you dan um this was an awesome conversation. Uh, hopefully, we'll have you more of time in the future. Um, Great. Very enlightening. Thanks for sharing your information. I know you called yourself, I think it was a dinosaur earlier, but... Uh, <laughs> old dog. Old, old dog. dog. I'll go with that. Learning new tricks. Old dog, learning new tricks. More importantly, you're imparting the tricks that you've learned so far with to us. And uh, thanks for that. Sure. Thank you very much for having me on, Phil. Absolutely. Yeah.